to everybody of you. It's nice to see you again and see some new faces. This is our last lecture tonight um, in our um, with a topic Protestantism and participation. I, I'm not sure. I think most of you know me, but I will still present me. My name is Miriam Sauer. I'm part of the steering committee of this project and I have the pleasure to moderate our session tonight. And we have two excellent speakers, uh, Dieter Baumann and Christine Schließer. I will introduce you later, but from here, thank you very much for coming and contributing to this lecture tonight. It's a pleasure for us. So as we are on the very end of our lecture, I want to have a small glimpse back what we have been discussing until now. And our lecture had three parts. We started with quite fundamental theological insights. Our first one, the priesthood of all believers, um, discussed one of the most essential forms of participation in the churches of the Reformation. It's long ago from now that we talked about this topic. Um, we had also a lecture on um, on the question of how uh, churches in diaspora situations um, face the challenge to combine the church reality and the society and how they can create um, connections and how they can participate and bring their topics to the society. That was our second lecture. And then we had in the third one, um, our best practice example we got to know the um, community which was initiated and formed by volunteer participation, the young church in Gießen, Junge Kirche Gießen. And this session was also the moment where we discussed the meaning of non-ordained participation in our Protestant churches. In the second part, um, we looked at different roles that church can have. We discussed, um, so we discussed church relations with minorities and asked whether church should act as shelter or advocate. And finally, we were and are looking at different areas in which church could and should get involved. We learned about the church as an environmental activist and the theology that aims at the protection of the creation of God. We looked at more diaconical perspectives and today we are discussing Protestantism and peace ethics. It is one year ago now that the situation in the Ukraine escalated through Russian aggression. The 24th of February, 2022 is marking a turning point. And it's almost one year that people in Ukraine are still facing a horrific, horrific war in their own country. From our German perspective, at least that's what I can say, um, the theological debates on peace ethics have risen and, and become more virulent. And for us Germans, there is one question which is discussed from the very beginning until now, I think from political perspective, probably you noticed it. It's always the question, should German weapons be delivered to Ukraine? And this is uh, the question which also is um, discussed in churches and communities. And sometimes it feels like this war is narrowed down to this question for us Germans. Should German weapons be delivered to the Ukraine? So I am glad tonight to share thoughts and opinions with you to hear what issues and questions are virulent in your context. And we are doing this from a theological perspective. And for this reason, I want to invite you to begin and to warm up to participate in our beginning survey I prepared two questions for you, and both are asking um, for biblical and theological traditions, which could give orientation to us in this situation. Um, my first question to you is, which theological or biblical terms should be the center of theological reflection on peace and war? So I'm going back to a very theological question which theological biblical terms should be the center of theological reflection on peace and war? This is the question I am asking you personally. And the second question um, is, 
which keywords have been used in statements or sermons in the church referring to the war in the Ukraine. You, are, you can put in one word, two words, the maximum is three words. Um, Elisabeth put the link for the survey in our chat so you can um, participate now, please. Soon we will see the first results. On the question, which theological or biblical terms should be the center of theological reflection? You probably all know Mentimeter. Um, I'm just repeating for your information. As bigger as the words are, um, the more they were put in. So justice is probably the word which has been used most and the small words might be just one or two persons. So I can see the main words, love and justice. Then we have prayer, peace, Jesus Christ, um, patience, sermon on the mount, the just war tradition, Hosea 6.6, 6, wholeness, Christ is peace, freedom, John 14, 27, integrity, dignity, reconciliation, prayer, peace. So justice is in the very middle and justice will be one of our topics tonight. Thank you, Elisabeth. Can you show us the second result, please? Uh, I invite you now to use the second link and participate in our second survey as well. Welcome, Xili, from the train. I hope your connection will be enough <laughs> to participate tonight. Okay, I think nothing is moving any longer. So we see peace in the very middle and justice. Um, of course, the words now are not used so often by different persons. Um, speak out, finding a home, prayer again, spiral of violence, Pacifism, shelter, shalom, the never again, just war and not staying silent. 
at least the prayer and the pray will be part of our second keynote and others as well. So thank you very much for this first insight and for getting into the topic. Elizabeth, you can close the results again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> our lecture tonight has uh, three parts. We have two keynote lectures by um, Dieter Baumann and Christine Schließer. After this, we have a very short and um, breakout session dis discussion, mainly to um, for you to find questions, because in the last part tonight, we will have a general discussion with our keynote speakers and you will have the, you can have your questions asked or you can ask your questions, it's maybe better put. And so this is our agenda tonight. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our first keynote speaker tonight. It's Dr. Dieter Baumann. Dr. Dieter Baumann is theologian and pastor of the Reformed Church of Swiss. He has worked in academic theology and published a lot of different contributions on the debates on peace and military ethics. Military ethics is also the title of his dissertation. Dieter Baumann works today in a leading position in the Swiss army. And tonight he will talk about the just war theory. Baumann says, I'm quoting, there aren't just wars, but there is a legitimated use of military intervention, which has to be structured by the law of the United Nations. Dieter Baumann, we are very glad to have you tonight and our digital floor is yours now. Thank you very much. I'll try to share. Okay, can you see it? Yes, it's there. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and especially the possibility to give you a keynote speech about uh, the topic of just war. Let's start with a quote. You see here, Eugen Drivermann said, we are wrong when it comes to killing people, no matter what the reason, no matter what the purpose, soldiers are murderers. Eugen Drevermann wrote these words in February 1998 in connection with the Iraq war. I do not share his general statement. Soldiers who threaten and use force within a legitimate and legal system are categorically different than murderers. And should we judge soldiers from all parties equally? However, regardless of how a war or conflict in particular or killing by or of soldiers in general is ethically judged, these words of categorical pacifism pose the greatest challenge to any military ethic. To a military ethic that concludes that under certain circumstances, people in their role as soldiers are allowed, indeed required, to use force and in extreme cases to kill. Even if one is convinced as I am against the categorical pacifism with Ambrose of Milan, for he who does not ward off injustice from his fellow man, if he can, he is as guilty as he who commits it. The question of the legitimate use of force, which includes the killing of other persons in extreme cases remains the core question of any military ethic, but also of any peace ethic. Above all, the statement of the Bishop of Milan leaves open how to define the injustice that is to be repelled and how this can be done proportionally and lawfully. The goal of my keynote is to provide you an overview of the development of the so-called just war doctrine or just war tradition from a Christian theological perspective and to give you food 
for thought to help you form your own judgment about this topic. Let's start with the time of the Old Testament. At the time of the Old Testament, the idea of creation out of chaos existed in the ancient Near East. By means of wars, the life hostile powers, the chaos, were pushed back by the gods. The gods and their kings then kept the chaos in check. One means of ensuring the security and order and therefore preventing a relapse into life-threatening chaos were wars, in addition to building activity and hunting. The kings had thereby the task to defend the life-promoting area against the enemies who did not submit to the rule of the king and thus of the king god. So as Eckhart Otto said, so that not war and peace, but war and chaos were opposites, which made it a constitutive task of a king to wage war regularly. These wars were often seen as wars between the gods or as proxy wars of the people for the gods. This also legitimized these wars Although economic and power political considerations were probably already central causes of wars at that time. The concept of war at that time was therefore always closely interwoven with the respective image of God and the resulting state and royal ideology. Nomadic tribes and clans, which later formed part of the people of Israel, experienced the victories in the early violent conflicts, especially in the exodus from Egypt and their settlement as miraculous deeds of their God. God was their man of war. In historical events, they saw his promises and faithfulness confirmed. Warfare changed after the emergence of the kingdoms of Judah in the, north, in the south and Israel in the north of Palestine. In addition to the militia organization that continued to exist, a kind of professional warriors emerged, partly consisting of mercenaries. Later, chariot detachments were added. King David originally a warrior himself and his successors, possibly with the exception of Solomon, waged interstate wars of conquest and defense and participated in political alliance of the day. In accordance with the Mesopotamian and Egyptian royal ideology of the time, the kings saw their military successes as made possible by God God fights with his king and protects him. The bond between king and God was celebrated, for example, in the temple of Jerusalem. As the kingdoms of Israel and Judah lost their political independence and the population became subject of the Assyrians or the Babylonians, they no longer had any military means of power. Now, to put it simple, a transfer of vengeance and violence to God as judge took place. God will either himself through his Messiah, through foreign empires, or in the end time struggle, re-establish or enforce the law of his people. However, the Old Testament also contains texts that attempt to limit warlike and general human violence. These include the well-known Talion formula, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And there is a series of law of war in Deuteronomy 5, chapter 20. Furthermore, in the prophetic tradition is also the idea of the peaceful pilgrimage of nations to the mountain of God, from which God will judge and instruct the nation, as you can see in the famous quote of Isaiah 2, um, 3, 
follows. Important basic texts on the question of a legitimate use of violence in the Christian tradition are, in addition to the sixth commandment of the Decalogue, thou shalt not murder, the New Testament texts on renunciation of violence and the love of enemies. According to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus of Nazareth called for renunciation of violence and this call was also understood as an active political religious statement. However, these themes were not initially related to the use of military force, since the first Christians were only able or willing to participate marginally, if at all, in state power. The early Christian communities accepted the Roman Empire and its institution for the most part, but distanced themselves from it to a certain extent in anticipation of the imminent return of Christ. As the second coming of Christ and the end of the world failed to come and Christianity continued to spread, Calls increasingly came from non-Christians to participate more actively in government service and to assume responsibility in the Roman army and the Roman administration. The church father Origen answered an accusation by the philosopher Celsus by emphasizing that Christians also fight for the emperor, but on a different level. Quote, but we also destroy with our prayers all demons who incite warlike undertaking and break oath and disturb the peace and thereby help the rulers more than the persons who go into battle externally. The question of whether a Christian can be a soldier was answered differently in the early church. But during the first three Christian centuries, there were Christian soldiers. This is shown by the acts of martyrdom of Christian soldiers. The arguments of the opponents were manifold from the cultic, the emperor cult, to the ethical, do not kill, to the eschatological. Even after the so-called constant and turning point at the beginning of the fourth century, when Christianity became the imperial, imperial religion, the majority of Christian theologians were aware of the tension between the renunciation of violence demanded by the New Testament and the use of force within the framework of responsibility for the common good. August, Augustine, a student of Ambrose, made an important step in the tradition of the just war. Under the impression of the destruction of Rome by the Goth and the associated accusation of guilt against the Christian, he tried to define the relationship between the earthly state and the kingdom of God more precisely in his work on the state of God. According to this, the main task of the state is to secure earthly peace. The Christians who belong to both states are also responsible for securing worldly peace. However, Augustine emphasized, war is waged in order that peace may be won. Therefore, even when you wage war, be a peacemaker. But according to him, true peace is possible only in the kingdom of God and in the worship of God. The doctrine, the just war tradition or just war doctrine, aimed to tie the justifications for war to certain criteria and to subordinate war to peace and law. Wars should no longer be misused as a means of earning a living, as a means of revenge, out of a lust for power, or out of personal passion. In the course of the Middle Ages, the doctrine was systematized, especially with recourse to Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, 
as well as to various non and pre-Christian scholars. The classical criteria that emerged are still used in discussions today. So legitimate authority, only a legitimate authority may wage war, just cause, there must be a just reason for waging war, right intention, the war must be waged with the right intention, with the goal of a renewed peace order, proportionality, for this reason, military force must be proportionate and with a reasonable change of success. Last resort, the restoration of injustice cannot be achieved by any other means than war. And the law in war, in a war, not all actions are permitted. The end does not justify the means. Formally, these criteria can be found almost everywhere where there is a critical reflection on war. However, the content of the criteria is strongly linked to the prevailing view of the world and of humanity and the underlying social understanding of justice and law. The reformers were also in this tradition of separation of church and state, so the secular and the spiritual power Martin Luther, for example, in his writing, ob Kriegsleute auch in seligem Stande sein können, emphasized that the one who starts war is in the wrong and no one can be a judge in his own cause. He, like the other authors, addressed the character attitude of the soldier in his writing. As a Christian, the individual should suffer rather than use violence, but out of responsibility for his neighbor and the community, he must use force as a soldier when there are compelling reasons. Whoever is a soldier out of this conviction is not after fame, power or wealth, but distinguishes must from will and need from desire. Furthermore, he was also convinced that if the soldier is sure that the authorities are waging war without authorization, quote, I also faithfully advise whoever wages war under such an unpeaceful prince that he run out of the field as far as he can run. Zwingli, not only a reformer, but also a military chaplain, who died in the Second War of Koppel, spoke out firmly against mercenary services. Consistent application of the just war doctrine requires an overarching legal order that is binding on all participants and enforced by a sanctioning body. However, the question of legitimate authority or just cause became increasingly difficult to answer especially in the context of the Crusades in confrontation with dissenters, the colonization of the Americas, and the confessional wars within the Christian world. This is how the idea first arose in the late scholastic period that there could be subjectively and objectively just wars on both sides and therefore just opponents. Ultimately, this undermined the question of just or lawful cause and placed it within the power of the rulers to define. This tendency became especially powerful after the peace of Westphalia. In a second step, this development led to a quasi free right to wage war by sovereign rulers. War was seen as a legitimate means of politics alongside others and with the emergence of territorial states was placed at the disposal of sovereign states. Because of the development towards the free law of warfare and in-depth elaboration, in elaboration of rules within warfare, so-called use in bello followed, which continues 
to this day. The further development of the rules of international humanitarian law mostly took place based on terrible war experiences or armed developments. Today, the main foundations of international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflicts are the hard regulations on land, land warfare, the Geneva Convention with their three additional protocols and Article 5 to 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Its five basic principles are the principle of humanity, the principle of distinction, the limitation principle, the principle of proportionality, and the principle of military necessity. With the elaboration of the international law of war and the simultaneous dispen dispensation on the question of the right to war, there was an attempt at a kind of hedging the war. But in the context of industrialization and the living on mass, even a cherished war showed its terrible face. Above all, the mutual mass killing in the two world wars made it clear that warlike conflicts coupled with an industrialized armaments industry and advanced weapons technology unleash dynamics that are difficult, if not impossible, to control. After the First World War, therefore, there was an important turning point in international law with regard to the question of war. The League of Nations Convention and, above all, the Brian Kellogg Pact of 1928 outlawed aggressive war. War is forbidden by the UN Charter. Since then, there has been no longer a right to wage war international law took a turn towards international peace law. The most important underlying principles of international law are the prohibition of the use of force in international relations, non-intervention in a sovereign state, and the protection of peace, which, is, which in today's world includes the protection of basic human rights. International law prohibits military force except for individual and collective self-defense, UN Charter Article 51, or on the basis of authorization by the UN Security Council in the event of an act of aggression, a breach of, of the peace or a threat to the peace. The classical criteria of the just war doctrine entered the international legal system. In practice, there is one main ob obstacle to establish a security policy based on international law. States do not trust the enforcement power of the collective security system or criticize it organizational form. The doctrine of just war has evolved over time into a doctrine of just peace. In the process, the question of a just peace order after the military use of force moved to the center and influenced the strategy of military operations. Peace is more than the absence of war. The decisive constitutional factors that make a just peace possible you find depicted in the civilization hexagon. Dieter Senghaas hexagram makes it clear that peace is an ongoing process with the guiding goal of just peace. However, neglecting one of the six elements inevitably leaves peace fragile. It points to the constitutive and necessary independencies between peace, justice, and law. In this tradition, I advocate an ethic of law preserving or law enforcement force or legal pacifism. 
The term pacifism expresses my conviction that a just peace must be the goal of all intergovernmental and societal action and that renunciation of violence should be the primary option. However, since people and societies are obviously violent and use violence, it is necessary to define within society and between states which form of rights preserving force is permitted and which is not. National and international law serves this purpose to ensure the state's monopoly on the use of force. However, sanctioning instruments are needed. Within the state, this is classically the police and between states, it is armies which are bound by international law and international humanitarian law. To conclude my personal conclusions, a Christian theological military ethics has two main tasks within a secularized society and army. First, it must provide Christians who are wrestling with the question of the justifiable use of military force with a basis for their own conscience. On the other hand, it has to support the justifications and principles of a secular, secular peace ethics, which aims at the pacifying, pacifying effect of international law. Third, it should also reflect the aspects of the attitude and virtues of soldiers. Under no circumstances, in my opinion, may a Christian theological military ethics contribute to formulating a justification for holy or just wars alongside international law or to calling for Christian armies. For this reason, one should consistently speak of Christians as soldiers and not of Christian soldiers. A Christian can, may, or must take on the role of a soldier as a citizen, but Christian soldiers are no longer allowed to exist today. Also at the end remains from my conviction, every killing makes morally, even if not legally, guilty. But there is also guilt when action is not taken where it should and could be taken, especially by political and legal leaders. The consequences of this entanglement of guilt were probably seen most clearly by the reformers. In certain situations, human beings are guilty of both the use and the omission of violence and are therefore not only dependent on human forgiveness. Here it can only be a matter of being able to deal with a possible assumption of guilt. So that concludes my keynote. I hope it was understandable and I give back the floor. Thank you very much Dieter Baumann for this very interesting insight to the history and um, present current perspectives on the just war theory. I really um, stopped by um, at the last point, the moral guilt of killing and the assumption of guilt. Um, but I don't want to start in the discussion right now, <laughs> but um, invite you to discuss now. We are going to break our sessions now for 10 minutes. And um, Dieter Baumann prepared also questions for you do maybe you switch one on? I think I saw it before. Yeah, thank you very much. So tonight we have you have two tasks in our breakout sessions. And you may pick one of these questions or two or just get inspired by the questions and discuss, discuss the matter. This is the first task. And the second task is that you write down one, two, three questions or how many questions you have, um, which came up to you when you heard um, the speech of Dieter Baumann. And I ask you to write them down and later on when you come back to write it in our chat. So we have a collection of our questions and when we are in our general final discussion, then we will get back to your questions, which should be preserved in the chat for everybody. So first, discuss these questions and second, 
um, please find your own questions and write them down to present to us later on in the chat. We are having our second um, keynote now. And I am very, very pleased to introduce our second speaker as well. Um, it is Dr. Christine Schließer. She is lecturer for systematic theology at the Ethics Center in Zurich. So we have a very broad Swiss participation um, tonight. And she has broad experience in international academic corporations. One of her main research areas, I hope it's okay to put it like that because of, you have many different areas, but one of the main areas um, is peace ethics. And in this area, she has published um, many contributions as well. The title of her last latest monography is The Role of Theology in Public Discourses on Ethics, in which she analyzed statements of the German Ethics Council and the Swiss National Ethics Commission. As a member of the CPCE Board of Ethics, she is one of the authors of the CPCE statement on the war in Ukraine. And this makes her, of course, a very interesting um, dialogue partner for us tonight too. And you, this, um, this statement was sent to you in preparation for this lecture. Schlisa says um, about the task we have as churches. We are all we are called to be ambassadors of peace and reconciliation. This means as churches, we pray, we speak up and we help. Christine Schlisa, you are going to talk about um, public theology and also this um, CPCE statement. And we are very curious now to hear your speech. Thanks very much for this very kind introduction. It is such a pleasure to be here tonight with you all, even if only virtually. And actually, as I was uh, just discussing in my own breakout session, I, I was tempted to just kick my lecture and, you know, let's keep discussing. Um, but then I guess I will say a few words uh, nevertheless, and I hope we'll still have some time later on to uh, discuss. Um, I'm very curious to enter into the discussion with you and to see your points of view, joining from the different contexts that you are in. I'll share my screen and I hope you're able to follow my PowerPoint presentation in just one second. So we've ha heard some insights on the so-called just war theory, which was and still is immensely influential. For the next 25 minutes or so, I will take you right into a discussion of a very specific forum. Uh, Mrs. Sauer just mentioned it, the Advisory Board on Ethics of CPCE. CPCE is you might probably know is the communion of Protestant churches in Europe. So a few days after Russia's attack on Ukraine, that actually began in 2014, but had entered a new stage almost one year ago, the advisory board on ethics met and we all agreed quite quickly that we as CPCE must not remain silent in the face of Russia's blatant breach of international law. But that was about where our agreement ended. Quickly, it turned out our discussion would get rather heated as very different opinions in terms of Christian peace ethics in general and the war in Ukraine in particular collided. It's always a special sight to have peace ethicists fight among each other. Yet before I'm going to present you at least some of the details of our discussion and the statement that we did in fact agree on in the end and which my colleagues graciously left to me to draft, I would like to step back briefly and think with you about the theological framework in which this statement is embedded. 
because every material theological reflection, be it on questions of war and peace, on economic injustice, climate change, migration, and so on, every material ethical reflection needs a solid theological foundation. We need to be able to answer this question. Why should we as Christians or as Christian churches even engage in public issues? This leads us to the need for a public theology. In a second step then, I will offer you some thoughts on how public theology matters and how it serves as a theological framework for the CPCE statement on the war in Ukraine. The catchword public theology is heard again and again in theological discussions. I'd be really curious, have you heard this term before? Maybe you can just briefly use that digi digital hand um, so I can get an overview. Public theology, öffentliche Theologie in German. Who has heard it before? Okay, we got one, two, three, four. All right. Okay, great. So at least uh, I hope it's uh, I'm not repeating too many things for you. Well, it is not always clear actually what is meant by it because it has become an, a global phenomenon, meanwhile, also an interreligious phenomenon. So let me very briefly. Um, sketch out how I will use the term in the following. And in understanding what public theology embraces, it helps to first think about what it rejects. In my part of Europe, which is Switzerland and Germany, the last decades, um, well, actually the last century, we could say, was very much influenced by the diagnosis of Max Weber, who postulated a disenchantment of the world. This postulation was associated with a so-called secularization thesis. That is the idea that secularization in our modern and postmodern societies is progressing ever further. And the influence of religion is diminishing ever more. Instead, the functions of religion are taken over by other societal actors. Since the Enlightenment, moreover, religion has been regarded as something more or less purely private that has no place in the public sphere or in societal and political discussions. This mindset, put in a nutshell, still influences us, our thinking and our actions in society, politics, and also at the universities, which is my primary background, at least in our Western European societies. And it also influences as we will come to see peace ethics. However, for some years now, a rethinking has been taking place towards a return to the question of religion. Some even speak of a desecularization of the world, even though that might be taking it a bit far. Or you might recall uh, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas speaking on post-secularism. So the interest in the role of religion and its significance for, so for social processes in our modern or postmodern societies is in fact growing. And this new awareness of the power of religion, and we must remember religion in itself, every religion is always ambivalent, which come with immense destructive power, but also very potent, positive and constructive resources. So the new awareness of this ever ambivalent power of religion is also empirically supported. A recent study of the World Population Review last year found that for 85% of this planet's population, religion is in fact playing a major role. 
or Peer Research Center, this major US think tank, um, conducted a um, encompassing uh, study in 2015, and they concluded the 21st century will be religious. Almost all major faith traditions will grow in numbers and in influence. So what we are witnessing currently, at least in Western European societies and Switzerland, Germany, and um, maybe also in some of your own contexts, the shrinking of institutionalized religion and especially Christianity is globally speaking, the exception. But there are not only empirical reasons to look at the importance of religion for our societies and for the challenges that we are facing, including war, pandemics, climate change, and so on. There are also very good theological reasons to do so. And these are central for us as Christians and as Christian churches, if we want to understand better the role of our faith, also in public, for ourselves, and also to make it understandable to the non or perhaps other religious person. We need a solid theological foundation to understand that our engagement in the public spheres, in politics and economics, civil society, including questions of war and peace and human rights, is not something external or perhaps even alien to the Christian faith, but something grounded in the core concerns of our faith. And this is where public theology comes in. To me as a Christian ethicist and theologian, this paradigm of public theology has been immensely helpful, not least in how it rejects the post-enlightenment separation of private religious on the one hand and secular public on the other. So in this mode of doing theology, we're holding both to the relevance of theology for public issues, for issues of war and peace, and to the relevance of these public issues for theology. You, so you have a circular way of thinking here. Now, who are the actors of public theology? These are not only academic theology, but also churches, church congregations, and each and every individual Christian. I mentioned before that public theology is a global phenomenon, so I briefly shed uh, some light on the thoughts of John de Grouchy, a public theologian from South Africa. And he points us to the following characteristics of public theology. Public theology engages in public issues without giving up its own theological profile. It is bilingual or maybe even better multilingual that means when we engage in public discourse we speak our own theological language so we don't become invisible as christians but we also at the same time translate it into a language that is understandable to people who are not christian uh, christians and not familiar with our language Public theology is interdisciplinary. It com combines a local rootedness with a global outlook, so it's global. It takes public issues into its own theological reflection. Public theology is firmly rooted in the church and it comes with a living spirituality. And I would like to add one more characteristic, which John de Grouchy assumes but doesn't make explicit, namely its Christocentricity. That is its orientation towards Jesus Christ as the heart of public theology. And this brings me to my second part, how public theology matters or public theology as theological framework for the CPCE statement on the war in Ukraine. So what does it mean in concrete terms for public theology to be oriented? For this, I would like to 
go back to the old dogmatic thought of the munus triplex. For those of you studying theology, you might have countered it before. That's the doctrine of the three offices of Christ who encounters us as king, prophet, and priest. And this doctrine is immensely helpful, especially in ecumenical contexts, because it constitutes a unique ecumenical phenomenon. It is accepted in all Christian denominations, and that makes it really, really helpful. So how is this old idea going to help us today? What does it mean for questions of war and peace? I think this becomes clearer when we relate the three ministries of Christ to his pre-Easter life, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So let's have a look at Christ the King. What kind of king do we encounter in the earthly Jesus? One who is so very different from what is commonly expected of kings. Jesus Christ is presented to us as the Prince of Peace. The royal office is revealed here as practice charity and forgiveness, as table fellowship with the poor and outcasts. So any domination or oppression is clearly rejected. Instead, public theology is reminded to pay special attention to the marginalized and the vulnerable, the oppressed. And this will become evident in the Ukraine statement, which we will have a look at in just a minute. So the cross then reminds public theology of the tradition of the biblical prophets and their commitment to truth, justice, and peace. So in this tradition, we raise our voices for others who cannot speak out for themselves. This is also important as we will see in the Ukraine statement. And finally, the priestly office, which can be unfolded from the perspective of the resurrection. Here, the church as the witness of Christ comes into special focus. The witness of radical hope comes alive here, transcending the limits of here and now. We do acknowledge the life-threatening gravity of war and death, yet we refuse to allow to have death the final verdict on us. Even within war, we give witness to the victory of resurrection over death. The power of communion, of worship, of intercessory prayer related to the priestly office becomes also visible in the Ukraine statement. You see here a screenshot from the website of CPCN. Perhaps you already had a chance to have a look at this statement. And like any decent sermon, you will have noticed it has three points. But as you know now from what I said on the Munus Triplex, these three points of the statement can also be connected to the three Munera. I'd like to take you through this statement as one concrete example of Christian engagement against the war in Ukraine. It is available in five different languages namely English, German, French, Estonian, and Italian. I think we have a colleague joining us from Estonia tonight. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. Hello. Welcome. Great. Hello. Yeah. And one more thing before we go right into the statement. You have the official version probably in front of you, or you can find it online. I will now take you not through the official version, but through the original version. And you will see that there are some ways in which they differ from each other, sometimes very significantly. So let's begin with the executive summary. The war 
that Russia started against Ukraine in 2014 has entered a new stage with a Russian attack since 24th February 2022. As CPCE, we stand together with our sisters and brothers suffering in Ukraine, in Russia, and in other regions affected by the war in a threefold way. Pray, speak out, help. Together we pray, lament, and lift up our sisters and brothers to the God of peace and justice. So you already noticed that in the praying aspect, we connect to the priestly office of Christ. Then we speak out in condemnation of the breach of international law by Russia's President Putin as we stand in solidarity with our sisters and brothers and work together for peace and reconciliation. Here we are connecting to the prophetic office of Christ, right? Speaking in the tradition of the biblical prophets. Then we help by giving according to our means to support our sisters and brothers in terms of finance, goods and logistics, and by offering hospitality to refugees through both our church communities and private efforts. And here in our concrete attention and help to the oppressed, to the vulnerable, the kingly office of Christ shines through. Perhaps you remember that day on February 24, 2022, now almost a year ago. I remember entering the kitchen early in the morning. Our kids were already having breakfast, munching away on their chocolate muesli. And our youngest one called out to me, Mom, there is war. I think many people shared a sense of feeling shaken and shocked. So how do you find your voice as Christians, as Christian churches, in the face of unrestrained brutality? How do you even start a statement? I decided to start this statement with what is most important, though easily underestimated and neglected, namely intercessory prayer. As churches, we pray. Who'd be willing to read out this brief passage? Maybe you can just unmute yourself and go right ahead. All right, then I'll just read. As churches, we are called to prayer. Even as we voice our lament, we give witness to the power and promise connected to prayer. In this time of Lent, we join from east to west in order to stand in together for our sisters and brothers in need and to move the arm of God. This prayer ties back to the priestly office of Christ. It is the communion of believers who come together to do the single most powerful action in the face of Russia's aggression, prayer. I'd like to draw your attention to one detail that the public does not see. Have a look at my original draft of the prayer. Father, you are God of peace and justice. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Ukraine, in Russia, and the regions affected by this war. Now have a look at the official version. God Almighty, your God of peace and justice. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Ukraine and all places suffering, suffering because of the war. So in the process of the draft statement, going through the different stages of discussion, actually in our advisory board, we agreed on the original version. 
you see that the prayer for the Russian people, for Russians, was taken out. I believe this is a fundamental problem and a major theological mistake. Since when does love your enemies mean but don't pray for them? Furthermore, does it not fly into the face of any thoughts of reconciliation? As you will notice, is discussed in later on, point 2.2. I was rather unhappy indeed with the final version of the prayer. But let's move on to the second part. As churches, we speak out. As churches, we are called to speak out against injustice and suffering and to speak truth to power. This part draws on the prophetic office of Christ. In the tradition of the Old Testament prophets, we speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. I'd like to draw your attention particularly to one aspect, uh, which was also discussed in my breakout session just now. I don't know how it was in your own sessions, namely the fact that we are up into or over our heads into an ethical dilemma. Perhaps some of you watched the video podcast, Krieg und Frieden, War and Peace, I think the link was uh, shared beforehand. There, Ulrich Körtner, one of the people interviewed from Vienna, emphasizes this point when he says, we will all become guilty in this war. Why is that so? Think about the question of supporting Ukraine with weapons. While well, living in Switzerland currently, this is not so much a discussion over here, but I know in Germany and other European countries, this is very much on the agenda. Sometimes it seems to be the only thing on the agenda. Well, let's think about this just for a moment. Clearly, weapons are no decorations. They will be put to use and they will be used to kill people. So if we support Ukraine with weapons, we will become guilty of the deaths of the people killed by these weapons. At the same time, if we don't deliver weapons, Ukraine people will be defenseless in the face of Russian aggression. We become guilty of the deaths of those who cannot defend themselves. So there is no easy way out. We will not keep a white vest, so to speak. Faced with this dilemma, I find the theology of Dietrich Bonhoeffer very helpful. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for those of you who are not familiar with him, was a German pastor and theologian who was killed by the Nazis for his participation in a coup d'etat against Hitler. So in this statement, in the CPCE statement, I tried to voice this dilemma as follows. The complexities of the issues at stake here might threaten to overwhelm and paralyze us. How can we as churches be agents of peace and reconciliation, yet not be silent bystanders of gross injustice and human rights violations? There are no easy answers. And we acknowledge that every action and in action, and Dieter Baumann just pointed to this very aptly, involves guilt. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, everyone who acts responsibly becomes guilty. Yet we trust in the grace of God who calls us to responsible action. Prophetic witness means furthermore that we stand in solidarity and that we work for reconciliation. The last point prompted considerable discussion on our board. How can you possibly speak of reconciliation? How can you speak of it now while the bombs are still falling? Isn't this bordering on cynicism? Interestingly, my vote to include reconciliation in the statement was supported by our members from the Eastern European countries, namely from Estonia and Hungary. Those countries that are faced most immediately with the terrible consequences of war. So this is what went into the original statement. 
As churches, we witness to the truth that this world has been reconciled with God through Christ and that we are called to be ambassadors of reconciliation, not only with God, but also among humankind. History shows that sustainable peace needs reconciliation. As this war prompts new reflections on issues of security, defense, and cooperation in Europe, we participate in this process, not least through our engagement in reconciliation in Ukraine and beyond. And the last point, very briefly, as churches, we help. Here, the implications of the kingly office of Christ gives orientation to our concrete action. As churches, we give. We're called to give and to support those in need. The immediate action of churches involves help for refugees from Ukraine as well as for those who stay in Ukraine, alongside with the engagement for refugees from other parts of the world. Sometimes we tend to forget that the war in Ukraine is not the only war we have. This is active charity. And as churches, we offer hospitality. We take in refugees and we offer hospitality to our sisters and brothers in need. Just to give you one concrete example, um, the church that I'm currently attending has taken in 49 Ukrainians, offering them shelter, practical support and friendship. And I know of countless other church communities around Europe who have come up with very practical and creative help and support. And I'd be interested to learn about your own experiences and perspectives. Thanks very much for your attention so far. I very much look forward to our discussion. I have prepare, prepared a couple of questions for the breakout sessions, but feel free to discuss other points you find of interest. The discussion points I have pre prepared are first, what do you think of the paradigm of public theology? Do you find it helpful or maybe not so helpful? Why, why not? And the second question, imagine you're asked to write a statement on the churches, on the role of Christians and the Ukraine war. What would you include? And what is perhaps missing in the CPCE statement? Um, I'm also personally very interested to learn about your perspectives and I'd be happy to take it into our next discussions when we have a board meeting with the CPCE Ethical Board. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. This was very interesting too and I think it's really combined very well with our first keynote which gave general insights and the question raised um, quite went to the direction which you were answering right now so thank you very much and um, we jump right now to our breakout sessions we have now 15 minutes left and, and i really don't want to waste our precious time in this um interesting um group here i tried to um organize our questions from before and i think we cannot touch all the questions now, but I want to tell you that we had mainly questions on what, what should church do right now in terms of local action, um, in terms of um, pastoral counseling, and also what should, what, what should church do um, regarding ecumenism and the Orthodox church and the church in general. So this was one part, and then we have um, questions aiming at the question of um, military ethics, what means the escalation right now? And one question more asked, um, how can we find the right answers? And maybe are we in a situation where we can't know what to do is right and we have to wait and history will show us, um, future will show us, us what has been the right or the wrong thing to do. So I am, um, want to ask now one question, uh, want to ask now two questions and then two others. And I think then we finish for tonight. 
Um, and this one question is, um, I think, mostly for Dieter Baumann, but of course, uh, both of you can answer. Um, the question is, which are, um, from your specialist experience, means of de-escalation right now? What does this mean? And maybe we can, um, maybe you can react in a political way, but also, and what means de-escalation for us as Christians, as churches? Dieter Baumann. Okay, thank you for the question. So what it means for churches, I think uh, Christine is, is more the expert because I really want to, to separate uh, my fields. Uh, de-escalation right now is, is, is really difficult from a military point of view, but de-escalation has to 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 train to be trained before an uh, before an uh, before a war and you can see a little bit for me there are some russian soldiers who say uh, i'm not i think this is not a a, a legal um, war so therefore i run as Lutu put it, I run out of the field. And, and I think there, the, the neighboring countries, they really have to offer asylum for these uh, soldiers who say, I can't, I can't do this. I can, it, is not, it is against my conscience. It is against all that I learned in the law of armed conflicts courses. So there we can help, but, but that is not direct de-escalation and what is what is also going on is to yeah to show both sides that the international community is is um recording the um is recording the acts that are against the, the law of war and that maybe later there will be uh a tribunal, but right now, this is, um, yeah, the soldiers are attacking, are defending, and we just can say, uh, listen, there are some rules of, uh, of, of war, and uh, you have to respect them, and you will be, we will uh, make you accountable if you don't do it. Mm -hmm. But it's not a good answer, I know. But. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Schließer, would you maybe answer this question more in um, regarding church? What does de-escalation mean? And maybe the broader meaning is also, what can we do as churches and as Christians? And what bothers me currently uh, in the media is the, what sometimes seems to be the sole focus on weapons. Um, we are only discussing which weapons and which not, and who can send which and what not. And that seems to me the, currently the primary focus um, on our action in, in uh, supporting the Ukraine. And to me, that really seems to be a bit um, one-sided. Um, so to me, what, what would be important is that we raise an alternative narrative, that we don't get used to this war. There is no just war. There is no holy war. And Dieter Baumann emphasized it um, um, very, very aptly in, in his presentation. Um, so as Christians, as churches, we are called for a different narrative of peace, of reconciliation. So even if we can shift or, well, I'm not sure, pragmatically speaking, if we are strong enough to shift the focus, but at least to add an alternative strand to the discussion, um, that would be helpful. And to also shift our focus um, beyond the use in Bello, which is going on currently, how do we fight the war? What are the appropriate weapons? 
to the use post bellum, to the peace and the, the justice after the war. Um, Dieter Baumann just said that now it's, it's a bit too late to uh, train, to practice alternative approaches in conflict resolution. We need to practice that and to train that uh, in times of peace. So after the conflict is of course always before the conflict. So when we take the post bellum, the use post bellum after the, the war, after the conflict, if we pay more attention to that, I think we can engage in preventing other conflicts. And um, that leads me to the role of the churches. What, what can the churches do? Um, yes, last night, actually, I returned from Brussels, um, from the Keck. Uh, you might uh, be familiar with it, the um, Conference of Churches in Europe. And there, um, uh, we, uh, we discussed a new um, initiative called Pathways to Peace. Um, which is meant to be an ecumenical effort that not only comprises Protestant churches, but all churches in Europe in a concerted effort for peace and to look for alternative ways. Um, and uh, this name, Pathways to Peace, of course, resounds um, a similar initiative um, published by the World Bank Group and the UN in 2018 ways for peace and this paper was actually focused on prevention so this is what we can do to prevent the next conflict and two um thoughts that stuck with me from our meeting in brussels um, was focus on the youth we have refugees from ukraine we have refugees from from Russia, um, reconciliation and peacemaking starts right now, starts right there. And a colleague of mine from Estonia, um, and our colleague here from Estonia, might you might know him, Miko Remmel. Um, he's a pastor in the Baptist church, and he was telling me of a fantastic initiative they did with youth um, refugees from Ukraine, re youth refugees from uh, Russia, and also Estonian youth gathering together in Christian youth camps together, united in fellowship, in worship, but also in fun stuff, playing soccer and other things. So I think this is something we as churches are uniquely equipped to do, to focus on the youth. And the second thing I want to mention is, um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking too long, very briefly, the Russian um, Orthodox Church was mentioned. And I think we must take Kirill's um, statement seriously and his theological justification of this war, which theologically speaking is, is untenable. So we must meet him on his own playing field. We must meet him theologically. So that is also part of the Keck initiative that we, we write, we formulate, we engage in an alternative theology, which unmasks this theology of domination and oppression and Raskimir that we encounter in Kirill's statements. We present a theology of peace and of reconciliation. Thank you so much, um, both of you. Um, I think the statements you made right now um, come down to these two points. There is no just war and um, reconciliation and peacemaking is right now, is what I hear um, Dieter Baumann saying kind of, and Christine Schlisa too. So I think this is a good final statement for our forum today. Thank you so much. Um, I want to point out to everybody that I put the link to the Krieg and Frieden chat for everybody being able to um, listen to German text, right, um, in the chat. So you can um, feel free to enter it and um, see the video podcast and you can see Mr. Baumann and um, Mrs. Schließer again. Um, I want to thank the two of you that you um, contributed tonight to our discussions. I want to thank everybody coming in here. I can say very personally, I feel kind of pity that we are in the end of our lectures because um, it's so rich to 
to log in at 18 o'clock or in Germany at 18 o'clock and talk to people from Italy, Hungary, Estonia and so many other countries um, to unite as Christians. And Christina Schlisa said before, uh, let's keep discussing. I think this is a very good bridge for us because we want to keep discussing with all of you. We are going to invite you now, and this is the last word for tonight. I pass the word on to Gerhard. Um, he is going to talk about our present conference in Sibiu Hermannstadt. You are very welcome, and I really hope from the bottom of my heart to see many of you again there. Gerhard. Thank you. Um, I will show some very beautiful pictures of <laughs> Romania and uh, Sibiu, Hermannstadt Notch 7. This uh, place, uh, like uh, a lot of places, has three names in Romanian, in German and in Hungarian, because it is a place where a lot of people, confessions, live uh, and um, together. We have a picture from Sibiu with Evangelical, Catholic and Reformed Church. It is also, uh, not uh, to forget, a very Orthodox uh, country. And uh, when the Young Forum Theology, uh, Young Theology Forum will uh, take place in Sibiu, we will have the Holy Week for the Orthodox Church. And uh, at Friday, we have in the program uh, the visit of the service on um, uh, Friday, when uh, before Easter, uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, quite every year two times Easter with the West and with the Eastern churches. Um, this is the place where I work, the CETO, Centrum Evangelische Theologie Ost. We will visit this also. This is the theological institute in uh, Sibiu in German language. Um, and this is the place where we will um, uh, speak, discuss, eat and uh, sleep. Evangelische Akademie Siebenbürgen, Akademia Evangelica Transylvania. You have the link, uh, easneppendorf.de. Now it uh, looks like that. <laughs> it's a very actual uh, picture. We have um, winter. Uh, the winter is uh, here. And um, in this place, we are ha having uh, more places to take place the conference it's a big uh, um, hall and uh, we can have uh, also services and prayers in this uh, evangelical academy uh, more places to have discussion these uh, are two pictures from other conferences and it, it's a very ecumenical place uh, I'm very glad that uh, I'm very happy that uh, it is a church very in the neighbor uh, and uh, it's a very old church with a big history. We will visit it. And now you see the program. Um, we will begin begin 12th of April and uh, with the first keynote of uh, Christine Schlieser. We will visit Sibiu, young since 1191. It's uh, the date where when uh, Sibiu was first mentioned in the documents. We will have um, country reports and evening prayer in the main church. Uh, we will have uh, we will work on the outputs. Maybe, and I hope, we will meet students or theologians or teachers or interested people of Sibiu. And, like I said, we will visit an Orthodox service at Good Friday. Very interesting time for the Protestant uh, conference. And then the last uh, day, after breakfast, prayer and finalizing outputs, we will have the presentation. 
and evaluation and the journey blessing. The project partners are Protestant League Hesse, CPCA and CETO. And here I would like to uh, welcome you in this very, very interesting um, place. You have uh, three um, links. You can, um, yes, uh, I will put it in the chat. And uh, ah, yes, we have, uh, this is a very interesting link and the airport link. <laughs> And uh, also this um, air if you want to come by plane, but you can uh, drive. It's a very good experience to drive from Switzerland or from, <laughs> from Germany uh, until Sibiu. You will feel the distance, but you can fly also with uh, the the airport is very very near to the evangelical academy welcome next uh, I, I i say this year not next year <laughs> thank you very much gerhard so most important to you go to our home page and register right now you have the link in the chat down um you will get more information also via email, but you can register or at least you can apply. You remember we have to, uh, as we are funded by the European Union, we have to um, some rules who can part, take part and we have to see how the group is. But please apply now and then we hope to see you again. Thank you very much for everybody for coming and um, stay blessed. Goodbye.